Hello, my name is Mikkel. I'm a digital nomad and content creator. If this is your first time here, welcome. Today, I'm going to be getting into how I got a positive approval on the Spain digital nomad visa. So before we get into it, just a little bit of backstory about me. I'm from the US. I work as a freelancer and I have ongoing contracts. So I was granted this visa for the full duration of three years and I just finally had my TIE appointment. And this is going to be my experience of going through the visa and actually getting it and what all it entails. Now, before I get into this, I want to mention that this visa is not consistent across everyone. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of people who have applied with more than I will share today and they haven't been approved. And there's people that have applied with less and have been approved. So there's a lot of inconsistencies in the application process. And that's why I wanted to kind of go on here and share my experience and just share some insider knowledge. Now, regardless of what you go ahead and do, and if you do decide to apply for this visa, it's really important that I recommend applying with a lawyer. And the reason that I say this is because there is such inconsistencies among applications, and this is why you'll see so many different things on the Facebook groups. A lawyer is really gonna help you to make sure that you actually get across to the finish line. And regardless if you speak Spanish or not, trying to apply for this visa as it isn't straightforward, I just wouldn't recommend. So what today is going to look like is first I'm going to be debunking the myths. I'm also going to be getting into the requirements. Now in below, you're going to see a whole checklist of everything that I actually submitted so that you can go ahead, take a look at that. You don't have to worry about taking too many notes here. I'm also going to talk about the social security situation, which a lot of Americans have a lot of questions about, as well as the unknowns that still stand with this visa. And then I, like I said, I'm going to give you guys a sample of everything that I submitted so that you know exactly what everything looks like. When this visa first came out, there was a lot of myths and a lot of incorrect information about it. So the first one was that this is a 15% tax rated visa, meaning that you only have to pay 15% in taxes. Now that is not true at all. Um, you are going to be taxed, unfortunately, on the normal Spanish system, which is going to be a progressive tax rate. Now there was other things that came out and said that you could apply for Beckham's law. However, Beckham's law has not been ratified for digital nomads to apply for it. So at the moment, you can't apply for this either, especially if you're filing as self autonomo. So if you're going for this visa and you're doing it, for tax reasons, you are going to be paying full on 19 to 47% of the progressive tax system. And the only way that you can go for Beckham's Law is if you're setting up a new company in Spain. And I'll put some more information about Beckham's Law below. But if you're doing this visa to save money on taxes, you're better off applying for the Croatia Digital Nomad Visa, Portugal, or even Greece, just as the tax situation is totally better all year around. Now, getting into the benefits of this visa. So beyond living in Spain, where it has tons of sunshine, Shine, affordability, as well as amazing quality of life. One of the big benefits with this visa is you can turn it into a permanent residency. Now, with that being said, you can only be gone six months out of the five years of the residency. So if you're someone like me and you like to actively travel, this doesn't really seem super realistic as I was out more than six months even this past year. Um, but just something to note. Another benefit of this visa is you do get insured by Spanish healthcare. So if you get pregnant or anything happens, you're fully covered. You don't have to pay anything, nothing out of pocket, and it's a really good healthcare system. And then the last benefit is obviously getting to bring your family. And I'll put some more information about that below just so you can check that out. Now, diving into the um, process and what it entailed. So in total, by paying the lawyer, paying for the translations, paying for everything, it cost me $2,000 for the entire process. So that just gives you a look. Now, of course, you can go for it on your own, maybe bring that amount down. But realistically, I think this is what it's going to cost to really get across the finish line. So there's a two step process. First, applying for the visa, and then second, getting your TIE registration, which is basically like your residency card. So first, when you're going for step one, what are the requirements? So the number one thing that the Spanish government is looking for is they are looking for money. And the more money that you can show, the better position you're gonna be in. So minimum, you need to be able to show that you're bringing in $2,160 a month, or about an average of 20 
five to 30K a year. Now, if you can, what it is recommended to do is to also show them a bank account with that much money. Now, I did do that. I showed them about 25K as well as an average um, that was about three times the income they were looking for. This is what my lawyer advised me to do. I'm not sure this if this is why I got approved for the whole duration, but the more money that you can show them, the better situation you're gonna be in and the more likelihood you are for actually getting accepted. Second thing they're gonna look at is the contracts. So with the contracts, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it says that it's ongoing. You're gonna to wanna to remove anything that says that like, oh, you could be terminated or you need to be, um, we can let you go. Like that all needs to be removed and this needs to look like a permanent contract. No. Additionally, the other thing they're gonna be looking for is proof that this company actually exists. So you're gonna to have to get a registration of good standing. This is something that you can request from the government or the company directly, but they're just gonna need that proof that the company's been there a year and that you've been there for a minimum of three months. So diving deeper into the requirements, they are looking for work contracts. I went ahead and submitted two different ones. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you remove anything that says that you could be terminated or fired. This needs to look like this contract is super ongoing and it can never come to an end. They're also gonna to wanna to look at three months of bank statements as well as a note from your employer. And I'll have the exact notes that I submitted below just so you can see what those look like. You're also going to want to submit your resume as well as either three years professional experience. This could look like tax documents, resume, or um, a translation of your college degree. Now, when I submitted, I submitted everything translated. So, and it had to be officially translated. Now that has kind of changed a little bit, but my recommendation is to go with what the lawyer says or at minimum submit a translation as well. The next thing that now, you're gonna wanna go ahead and submit is your proof of accommodation. Now, if you do happen to already have an apartment rented in Spain, this is gonna be a bit better. However, this can be really challenging, especially if you don't have a need. Um, so this part can be a bit hard, but make sure that you also submit your proof of accommodation and that you're actually here in Spain. If you do decide to apply from the United States or outside of Spain, you can only get this visa for up to a year. And given how lengthy the process is, it's definitely worth it to get it for the full three years. Now, the other thing you're gonna have to submit is a basically an FBI background check, and this is going to have to have a Hogue stamp on it. And this can take some time to get. So I got my stamp accelerated. It cost me an extra $200 and it still took about seven weeks to get done. So when you start at first kind of going through this process, make sure you get a background check and start and submitting for that stamp just because this can really slow you down and i know for people from the uk um, this is another thing that slowed them down as well so just making sure that you're starting to prepare for that the next thing you're going to have to have is in basically a note saying that you're going to apply to be self-autonomous now the way that this visa is written and the way that it sits it's not possible to apply for this if you are a w-2 employee in the united states now the reason that is is the united states will not issue basically a note saying that you're paying social security in the u.s so this has been an ongoing issue between the spanish government and the u.s government something they've been dealing with over this past year and unfortunately Unfortunately, there's still no resolution and what they're saying now is that you need to be an independent contractor and you're going to have to register in Spain social security system and then you're going to have to pay here you can get a note from the Spanish government to exempt you from the US social security which is what I will be doing um, I'm in the process of getting that note but basically just know that you need to be 1099 employee to go for this visa and you need to have been doing it for a minimum of three months. Um, and if you are W-2, it's not going to end up working out for you just because of the way the visa is written right now. The one thing you need to have is a copy of your passport that has a stamp saying that you entered into Spain. Now, of course you could enter, let's say you fly into Italy and then now you're in the EU. However, I do know people who have gotten denied because they don't have the stamp saying that they're accurately in Spain. And then when it comes to the TIE or actually even that residence card, when I went, they specifically looked at that stamp. So you're gonna save yourself a lot of trouble by just making sure that when you do go for this visa that you enter in directly through Spain and that you have that stamp. Now, once you submit for the visa, you can stay here as long as you are in the process. 
So you don't have to worry about, oh, well, my 90 days are almost up. Like me, I basically applied when I had like seven tourist days left and then I was able to stay during the whole process. So just making sure that you have that stamp and plan on staying in Spain, I think for at minimum six months because this visa has taken forever to get, um, just because it's going to take a while. Diving deeper into what happened to me. So I applied at the end of June. It took me two months to get a resolution. And the way that I got a resolution was by a silent approval. So basically the Spanish government has 20 days, business days, to accept your application. If they don't, your lawyer can apply for basically silent approval. And that's what my lawyer did. However, what happened when I applied is there was a group of us, about 10 of us, who had applied in that last week of June and none of us heard anything back. So even though my lawyer went for the silent approval, we were still at the mercy. I didn't end up getting my approval till the beginning of August. And then after I got the approval, I couldn't get an appointment for the TIE until last week. So I didn't have my final appointment till the end of November. Now, the TIE is basically going and getting that residency card. The reason it's taking so long for an appointment is because the government is so backed up with people applying for this visa. Now, with getting the TIE, you have to go in the city that you um, are living in. So I had to do it in Valencia. I couldn't go and do it in Barcelona or Madrid. Depending on where you are in Spain, it may not take you that long. In an ideal situation, you would get this card within a month of being approved. But many people like me waited months and months to get an appointment. That's why it's really important to make sure that you're camped out in Spain and ready for as long as this whole process will take. When you do go to this appointment, what you're gonna need is the empadramento. I know I'm saying that wrong, but basically it's the, sen the census. And you're just registering to say that you live in Spain. I'll put some information below about what you need for that. You'll need your photos, you need your resolution, and you'll also need your passport. And you're basically showing up giving them the information. It takes about five minutes. They're fingerprinting you. And then I will go in January and actually pick up the card. So there's no way around this. You can't pay a lawyer to do it. You have to go with physical papers and actually present your information and then they will give it to you. The catch is though, is that for some reason you go for the silent approval, you get a yes. You're waiting for the appointment. You can't get an appointment. The, cover, the Spanish government technically, sorry about that, the Spanish government technically can come back and deny you in that period. So this was a bit unruling and why I delayed making this video just because in that four months, I didn't want to come out with this and then actually end up being taken away. So as much as you can try to get an appointment, I had my lawyer working on it the whole time and at one point I actually hired a hacker to get me an appointment because basically they drop online and they only drop at a certain time of the day. There's a lot of speculation here of when they drop and when you can get one and nada nada and basically having the hacker he was going to hack the system and get me an appointment but my lawyer ended up getting me one before. So it is hard to get the appointment however if you go to a very small city in Spain, you're way likely to get a TIE appointment sooner. However, bear in mind, wherever you register, you're going to have to pay taxes and you're going to have to have an apartment there. Now, getting an apartment in Spain. This was a really big challenge because I have US contracts and my boyfriend is self autonomo here and he's Italian. Now, a lot of Spanish landlords aren't gonna wanna work with you because of the insurance situation on the apartment. So what we had to do is we had to show quite a bit of money um, and then we actually had to use his need. Now with me, I didn't have a need. This was something that my lawyer did in the process of my application. So if you are trying to get an apartment, and you don't want to wait till you have the nomad visa i would get a name first just so that you can get an apartment because without a name you can't actually rent an apartment or get um, utilities or anything like that so it's going to be a really big problem um and i will link my lawyer's information below i did get the approval however i don't know if i'd recommend her a lot of these lawyers in spain you'll hear from them they'll give you some information and then they ghost and that was kind of what my process looked like with her 
Okay, I want to dive into the unknowns about this visa and questions that I've gotten over the past few weeks, which is what if my contract ends during the three year period? What will happen? There is not a direct answer for this from the Spanish government yet, I think because the visa is so new. However, I can assume that as long as you can show the money and show that you're still making that minimum amount during those three years, that you would be fine. Um, however, this is an unknown. The other thing that's an unknown is the social security situation. So basically to claim social security in Spain, you have to pay into it for 15 years. Well, what if I go for the visa for three years, decide I don't want to do it anymore? What happens to that social security? Now, I can't manage to get a real answer about this from anyone. So that's really unclear and hopefully something that they will be clearing up in the future. But that part is a bit of a whim. That's why this visa, unless you're 100% sure that you want to live in Spain, the social security situation does make it a bit unattractive, especially given that after the first year, more than likely your social security will go up between three to $500 per month on top of taxes. Kind of summarize it a bit for you guys. So this visa, mainly they're looking for money. You need to be a contractor, you need to be ready to pay social security in Spain and get ready to jump through some hoops as it's a pretty inconsistent process. Even though it is a very good visa, it is a rather long process. So I'll do my best to answer any additional questions in the comments. And like I said, I do have that free um, gift for you guys that has exactly everything I submitted as well as a checklist just so that you can look at that. And I will put my lawyer's information below and I hope to see you guys in Spain. Thanks for watching. Bye.